Hello and welcome to this series of instructional videos for the third year analytical chem labs. I'm Dr. Robin Studley and this video will be about the instrumental setup for inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry or ICPMS. The instrument that we are looking at is the Agilent 7850 ICPMS. We will begin by looking at the auto sampler. Samples are loaded into the auto sampler, and a motorized sampler arm draws the solution into the instrument. A rinse solution is used between samples to limit cross contamination. A peristaltic pump draws the solution through a capillary tube, taking it from the auto sampler and bringing it to the nebulizer. This is a concentric nebulizer. Argon gas flowing rapidly out of the tip draws solution out along with it, creating a spray of aerosol. The aerosol proceeds into a spray chamber. All ICPMS use spray chambers. This one uses a design called a Scott spray chamber. The aerosol enters the chamber and larger droplets collide with the spray chamber wall, where they then drain away. Smaller droplets circulate in the argon gas flow and exit the chamber supplying a constant stream of finely sized aerosol to the torch. The torch is composed of three concentric quartz cylinders and has a radio frequency, or RF, coil around it. The RF coil provides the power for the plasma. A steady flow of argon spirals out from the outermost cylinder, keeping the plasma contained and preventing it from melting the torch. The middle cylinder supplies the argon gas that forms the plasma, and the inner cylinder injects the sample aerosol into the plasma. An initial spark ionizes the argon, and the resulting free electrons and argon cations are accelerated by the oscillating RF field. Collision with other argon atoms ionizes them, sustaining the plasma. The very high plasma temperature originates from the high power input from the RF coil. Upon entering the plasma, the solvent evaporates, then the sample is vaporized, meaning it enters the gas phase. It's atomized, meaning molecules are broken down into individual atoms and simple polyatomic molecules, and then ionized. Positive ions strongly dominate. The resulting analyte and argon ions move towards the interface, which couples the plasma to the mass spectrometer. The interface consists of two cones, a sampling cone and a skimmer cone. The sampling cone passes a small fraction of the analyte and argon ions from the torch. The number of ions entering the mass spectrometer is further reduced by the skimmer cone, which lies directly behind the sampling cone. Ions that don't enter the skimmer cone are carried away by pumps, which maintain a vacuum within the interface and in the rest of the mass spectrometer too. In the mass spectrometer, the ions pass through two electrostatic lenses, which focus them, and then through an offset lens. In the offset lens, a strong electric field deflects cations upwards towards the collision cell. Uncharged particles and photons are not deflected and do not proceed. This improves system performance by reducing background signal. The octopole collision cell is crucial for removing spectral interference by limiting polyatomic ions from entering the quadrupole mass analyzer. The octopole consists of eight charged rods inside a chamber filled with helium gas. Recall the ion beam contains both monoatomic and small polyatomic ions. As this mixture travels through the helium-filled collision cell, the bulkier polyatomic ions collide more frequently with helium atoms. The polyatomics thus lose a greater amount of kinetic energy than the monoatomic ions. A small repulsive electric field is applied at the exit of the collision cell as a barrier. Only monoatomic ions have enough kinetic energy to overcome the barrier, while the slow polyatomics are prevented from traveling further. This portion of the instrument can also be run as a reaction cell, which uses chemical reaction with hydrogen gas to add a proton to an analyte ion. This shifts its mass to charge ratio by one. That is often enough to separate your desired signal away from an interfering one. The ions proceed to the quadrupole mass analyzer. It filters ions by their mass-to-charge ratio. 
The quadrupole consists of four parallel rods, each with both AC and DC voltages on them. The details get complicated, but basically pairs of rods have opposing polarity, and that positive-negative polarity switches back and forth rapidly. All of that generates an oscillating electric field down the center line of the quadrupole. The oscillating field applies an oscillating force to ions moving through the quadrupole. Their resulting trajectories depend on their mass-to-charge ratio and the magnitude of the voltages on the rods. For given magnitudes of AC and DC voltage, only ions with a specific mass-to-charge ratio will have a stable trajectory and can travel down the length of the quadrupole to reach the detector. Ions with higher or lower mass-to-charge ratios will have unstable trajectories through the quadrupole and either collide with the rods or exit the region between the rods and be removed by the turbo pump. Ions with unstable trajectory do not reach the detector. The shaded regions on this graph show the range of AC and DC voltages that give stable trajectories for different mass-to-charge ratios. To measure a whole mass spectrum, the magnitude of the AC and DC voltages applied to the rods are varied with time. As the voltage conditions vary, only ions possessing the right mass-to-charge ratio for a stable trajectory are passed to the detector. The detector is an electron multiplier. Ions entering it strike a cathode, which causes multiple electrons to be emitted. These are accelerated into another electrode, ejecting even more electrons. This process repeats several times, until the now large flow of electrons reaches the anode, where the current is measured. The signal is converted to digital form, which goes to the computer. I hope this video has been useful for you. If you have any questions, please direct them to me or your TA. And thanks for watching.